and the Communications Manager for the Bellevue Schools Foundation. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, the Bellevue Schools Foundation, we're a nonprofit that raises funds for Bellevue Public Schools. We help to bridge the gap between state funding and what kids really need to be successful. So I just want to thank all of you so much for coming. This is our first event in the Education Connection Spring Series. We'll have another event next month and then another event in May. So I do encourage you to check those out. They're really great events. Um, I especially want to thank those of you who are foundation donors because this program, you are the ones who are making it possible. I think you're really, really going to like hearing everything that you hear today. It's an awesome, super exciting program, and it's all thanks to you. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and introduce our speakers. This is Greg Bianchi. He has been with the Bellevue School District since 2004. He's worked as a science teacher, a course lead, a curriculum coach, and now he's the curriculum developer for the K-5 STEM program. And then a little later, we'll have Beth Hamilton over here. She's the principal from Medina Elementary, which is one of the STEM pilot schools. And then she also brought along four students to share their experiences. So we're really, really excited to hear what they have to say. And with that, I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you. Welcome. Appreciate the great turnout today and want to begin just by thanking Bellevue Schools Foundation for their amazing support of this initiative. Really excited to share with you what we've been doing at elementary uh, in STEM. But uh, before I jump into our progress, first kind of starting with a why STEM, right? Why, why are we putting this emphasis on STEM and where are we going with it? Um, first of all, STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. And when I share that, um, sometimes the reaction is, oh, this is about jobs, right? This is about the economy. Uh, well, it, it's partially true, uh, but that's not the whole picture, right? There are lots of reasons why we're pursuing STEM. Um, we can talk about, certainly, that in Washington, it's true that we have a big STEM gap. So when we look at our, our STEM uh, prepared workforce, and the STEM jobs available in Washington, we have one of the biggest gaps. That's why you see the number 49. However, there, there's a really bright side to that, which is that the reason for that big gap is we're number one when we think about STEM jobs, right? And we're the, we have the fastest growing STEM job market as well. So um, it means opportunity for our students. So that, that is part of it. But whether or not a student goes into a STEM-related career field, you're still going to require the 21st century job skills and, and, and real life skills, not just about jobs, but life skills. Like when, when students are doing our STEM experiences, and I'll take you through a couple of pieces of curriculum later, but really they're working creatively to solve problems. It's problem-based learning. And they work in teams, so collaboration is a skill that they are developing. They have to apply critical thinking and use technology, right? And they, and they do engage in the core subjects. So it's not like this is replacing the, the English language arts or the math. It's, it's all embedded, right? When STEM works well, it's, it's integrated. Another reason why, right, why are we going down the STEM path is that we have new science standards. You're probably familiar with common core state standards. Those are for math and English language arts. But we have the same thing in science. It's just called next generation science standards. You might not have heard as much about them because that's, that's more recent. So while we adopted Common Core in 2011 as a state, we've actually adopted the Next Generation Science Standards just this past October. Okay, but it's my role as a curriculum developer to make sure that we're bringing our curriculum into alignment with the Next Generation Science Standards. And that's definitely part of what this initiative is all about. And finally, um, I'm going to go back to that slide real quickly because I want to point out something that's new. This engineering and technology, the piece that's circled there, that wasn't in our standard, our science standards previously. But that certainly fits with STEM. And, and what also uh, is to like about that is that STEM engineering experiences, which, which is a big piece of what we're doing that's new, that, that's shown to really engage students who didn't necessarily find that science resonated with them previously. So it's about engaging all students. My focus is K-5, and that's really the focus for our presentation today, but at least I want you to be aware that there are STEM experiences at other grade levels in Bellevue. 
right? And this is something that we are shaping, but there's certainly great work already being done at middle school with robotics and Project Lead the Way. And at high school, right, we have problem-based learning there in the AP courses and, and certainly the, the Sammamish I-3 um, grant project. Additionally, there's great computer science work. We have the TEALS program, which brings employees from companies like Microsoft to work side-by-side -side with teachers and teaching kids how to um, use computer science, how to code, and so on. That's kind of the why stem. Why are we going that route? But why, why the elementary focus in particular? So we know now that one's interest in science really gets pretty solidified by the time the student is in middle school. So by eighth grade, you know, what, how they feel about science, um, it becomes hard to change that past that point. So the experiences that happen in elementary are critical for engaging students in science and helping them feel like, yeah, this is something that interests me, this is something I can do, they get confident in, and they enjoy it. So that's, that's a, uh, a big part of our game plan, is, is that elementary matters, it matters a great deal. It matters in terms of their attitude, and of course it matters in terms of their academic preparation for success in middle school, high school, and beyond. So we do actually um, have an instructional initiative that we would want all students, right? We want all students to demonstrate proficiency in, in science on the 8th grade assessment by 2017-18. Um, this is a, one of our um, calls to action. So this connects with our STEM work. You can't um, have success in 8th grade if you're only beginning with STEM at the middle school. So in the beginning in elementary school, we're really helping get a head start. That's just not a, that won't end at 2718, right? That goes on. So, let's talk a little bit about where we're at with the elementary STEM work. Currently, we have three schools. It says pilot there because we're in year one. This is a broad, kind of five year initiative. So, the, the word pilot is kind of disappearing as we get farther into the work. But this first year has been a pilot in the sense that we have just three of the Bellevue Elementary Schools participating. Ardmore, Newport Heights, and Medina. I'm really excited to have some of the students here share with us a little bit later. That'll be fun. Um, as I mentioned, it's a multi-year effort. Originally, uh, we were going to be bringing schools on over the course of five years, but while this will still be a five-year effort, because that's what it's going to take to come into alignment with, with next-gen science standards, uh, we're accelerating the timeline for adding schools. So we will be adding schools. That's the expansion bullet there. We'll be adding schools um, probably six schools next year, the remaining schools by year three. Bottom line is all the schools would be involved by the end of year three, or by year three. And let me just point out one other thing. We don't have a magnet model. So in other districts you may run across like a STEM magnet school or that type of terminology. We think STEM is really critical for all students. So while we do have these three pilot schools, everything that's going on at those pilot schools, we will incorporate that into Bellevue Elementary Education District-wide. Year one goals. There's, there's a lot on this list, and I'm, what I'll do is just take you through some of these points um, individually. So we'll start with curriculum development and kind of go down the list here of some of the exciting things we're doing. The biggest thing with curriculum is that we have introduced engineering design challenges to what we're doing. So we um, have selected a curriculum right now that we're piloting called Engineering is Elementary. And at each grade level, K through five, we have two of the design challenges that kids are experiencing. And we, we picked this curriculum because um, it's, it's a great curriculum that was developed by the Museum of Science in Boston and then was field tested in classrooms across the United States. So um, we looked at the research for Engineering Elementary and they had outcomes that suggested uh, and pointed to better knowledge of engineering, technology, and science on the part of students okay, when they go through the curriculum, more interest in, in engineering as a career, and enhanced engagement, right? And that's really important, particularly with the historically underrepresented groups. So what does it look like, right? We already had science curriculum, we had FOSS. So what we've done um, is take the engineering design challenges and combine those with the appropriate FOSS units. And the nice part about engineering as elementary is that the, the engineering design challenges were developed with, with FOSS in mind, really, and that they can match up pretty well. I'll give you an example. We've been using boss balance and motion at second grade, 
right, for, for a long time. And what we're now doing is we're pairing an engineering design challenge um, called Designing Bridges with that unit. So while students are learning about forces and balance and motion, they're now doing that in the context of designing a bridge. And so the engineering comes in and that the students are given a problem, like we need you to design a bridge that will span a certain length and it will be able to bear a particular load, right? Or maybe they're told as much as it can possibly bear, right? So they get to then do the design work and the testing, right? So it's very analytical and students are learning about the concepts that kind of underlie these science units, like balance motion, in the context of a problem like designing a bridge. So this is, the, I have some pictures here. Um, the, the one there is you can see kindergartners, they're designing ramps. So in this challenge, uh, kindergartners are learning really basic physics of, of pushes and pulls and their challenge is to get a, a school bus to go a particular distance. And so they have a ramp with the engineer to give it a push. Um, here you see first graders, and they're, they're engaged in um, one of our air and weather uh, FOSS units. We've linked a challenge called designing windmills to that. So they're exploring how can you best make a windmill where the blades can catch the wind effectively, and they design that and test that. Uh, there you see third graders who are working on knee braces that's paired with our human body unit. And then finally, that's a picture of a fifth grade landforms unit where students are designing ways to mitigate erosion and testing that. And the graphic in the center is meant to show you that it's a real iterative process. So the students are learning that when they do engineering, they're designing something, they're, they're creating it, they're testing it, and then they have the opportunity to redesign and go through that cycle again. That new curriculum, of course, requires learning on the part not just of students, but also the teachers. So we do have um, professional development set up to train the teachers on how do you go about teaching the engineering design process, and how do you specifically teach these engineering design challenges at your grade level. Um, in addition to meeting with me to kind of go through that, I also go out and coach and work with the teachers in the buildings when they need support and teaching um, those experiences for the first time. And we've developed a platform that we're using, actually. It's from the teaching channel, and it lets us collect video-based um, evidence of these things at work. And then teachers can participate by viewing the, the videos of other teachers, making comments, and learning through kind of a reflective discussion. And we're also kind of accumulating that video, so it helps with our sustainability as we go uh, down the road with the initiative. Another really important piece is uh, the critical thinking. I mentioned this being a, a really important 21st century skill. Well, really, it reinforces that it's not limited to the 21st century. Critical, critical thinking is essential and it always has been. But the way it connects to STEM is, when we do professional de development with teachers, we want to help them give frameworks to students where they get a framework like a claim and using evidence and reasoning to give and construct explanations for what they do in science. To clarify, I would say this. We don't want an experience where a student goes into a classroom in science, they're doing something, let's say they participate in an activity, they do it, they walk away from it, and they're not really sure what they got from it. And the teacher's not really sure what they, what they got from it. That's not good for any of us. So by getting students to construct explanations, they're doing that critical thinking about what they just participated in and what they now understand. And it's making it visible to the teachers. So the teachers know, okay, that, that important learning target was accomplished, right? And then they get feedback if a learning target was not accomplished. So this is really important work, right? So that there's kind of the constructing explanations and also engaging in argument from evidence where they can hear each other's ideas, respond to one another, so on. Why that and how this connects to Common Core Standards and why it's important? I want to point out to you that um, there are great overlaps in the STEM work. So by doing STEM, right, what we want to do is make sure that we're not just addressing next generation science standards with the STEM work, but we're addressing Common Core. So if you look at Common Core State Standards in math, you'll find this language. Construct viable arguments and critique the reasoning of others. In English, write arguments to support claims with clear reasons and relevant evidence. Right? Sounds familiar. 
and science engage in argument from evidence. Right? What do these all have in common? Evidence-based reasoning and argumentation, right? These are skills that we need to help our students develop. So we're providing professional development to teachers to get the students there. So a couple other um, neat part, points of the initiative are STEM, we, we feel, should be integrated. Clearly, if we look at the last slide, I'm talking about math and English right, and science and how that can be integrated. But even think about the arts. What would an art classroom look like in, in the 21st century? What should that look like? Um, we think that should involve you know, three-dimensional design and modeling using software. Using a, This is a picture of a 3D printer. So we're, we um, have 3D printers in our STEM pilot schools, and we're um, exploring curriculum that's right now being piloted to look at how can we make connections to our current art curriculum. Also, coding and computer science. You might have heard about the Hour of Code event, okay? So we're looking to increase students' exposure to computer science even at elementary. And we had um, the one hour Hour of Code event. We had great participation really from all of our pilot schools. We had um, coding nights and uh, it, it was tremendously well received by the students. So what we're doing is we're looking at what's the next step for coding um, at K-5, right? And that may include some coding, for example, at fifth grade, we're looking at a pilot right now of a, of a coding course, and we'll see um, what we learn from that about how that helps students. And finally, I would just like to talk about um, what happens outside the school day with STEM. Right? It's not just during the school day. We have family engineering nights, so we're looking to bring the community into what's going on with STEM. Coding night, I mentioned that. STEM week. I know Medina has a STEM week coming up here, I think, first week of April. So, um, all of these connections are important, and it's so important that you're here. And thanks again for being here, to be, uh, so that you have that understanding of what's going on in the schools. Um, and then I'll end on the robotics clubs and then transition over here to our Medina crew. The, the robotics clubs that we've established um, kind of have two forms. We have FLL and then Lego We Do. The Lego We Do is uh, what you see up front. You can look at this after if you'd like. Um, I have a couple of models set up here. We're using this with kind of the lower elementary primarily. And um, the way that it's important and why it connects to science is, uh, for example, taking a leg that you build out of Legos and then programming it to kick a ball a certain distance where you do the iteration of um, you know, break the program, test it out, go back, make adjustments, test it again. That's great science skill development, it's great problem solving, it's good critical thinking, so it really dovetails with what we want to do in the initiative. And the FLL um, is real powerful, and you, I even have some of the kids here in these pictures to, to share that, so I'm going I'm to let them do the great work of FLL. But the last thing I will say is um, the robotics piece needs support in the form of community volunteers. So um, just having someone who's interested doesn't have to have, have great background in robotics, but just if you have an interest and you want to participate in the STEM work, going to a school for an afternoon robotics club um, and just helping out, working with kids on that is not only is a lot of fun, but it's a great benefit to kids, so I hope you would yeah, consider that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Medina group and Beth Hamilton. All right, I'll let Greg change that. Well, thank you guys all for coming today. I was really excited when Greg and the BSF team asked for us to come share because we have a lot of good stuff going on at Medina right now, and kids are really excited, especially these four. You guys have to come a little closer to me. Your principal doesn't bite, you know that. They've been practicing in my office, and they keep saying, we feel like we're in trouble. We're sitting in your office. So um, I have four kids here that I'll share in a minute. I have Katie, Josephine, John, and Trevor. and. Um, Josephine, John, and Trevor are in fifth grade, and Katie's a fourth grader, and they've been involved in our FLL um, robotics as well as in our classroom pieces. So I'll start out by sharing a little with you about what we're doing at Medina as a STEM school um, this year. So first of all, as our initiatives, as Greg showed um, with our um, district initiatives, we've taken that at Medina and kind of jumped right in and really worked on this STEM critical thinking piece as our way of how do we tackle at college readiness at the elementary level. So how do we get those skills? We've been working on critical thinking at Medina as um, a focus for our school for the last couple of years. And when Greg came to us and um, 
brought us the idea of adding some STEM components that fit right in for our school to be able to continue that work with 21st century learning and prepare our kids for life, as we say at Medina. We prepare kids for life, not just for textbook learning. So we've been really focused on these 21st century skills, and as you'll see and hear from these kids, it is all day, every day at Medina, and even in our after school programs. So this is pretty small print, but um, what's going on at Medina is a lot is what Greg said. It's been full, it's almost every day, and then there's also um, extra pieces. So we have those engineering um, just units that go on in our classrooms from kindergarten through fifth grade. We did the hour of code. Every single student kindergarten through fifth grade spent at least an hour coding. Um, we have the Lego We Do Clubs, which have been exciting. We've had 120 kids in our kindergarten through third grade take part of those over the three trimesters. Um, so they've been in doing that, and teachers are leading that. So we're not bringing a company in or anything. It's the actual, our actual teachers are stepping up and, and leading those and working with our kids doing that. Um, then we have First League Lego, which these guys will talk about, that they competed and, and have that club going on. And then coming up, we have our teacher um, STEM critical thinking team planning our STEM week, which is different than your regular science week that we've had. We have... Um, Code.org coming in to do a presentation and an assembly for us. We're trying out the Museum of Flight, and they're going to be doing some things. Pacific Science Center, Family Engineering Night. So it's, um, we also are working with a lot of experts over uh, Google Hangout and Skype so that kids can have experiences with them during that week. And we're hoping that continues to go beyond the week, but it's a start for us. So I have a few pictures also of the Lego we do. I highly recommend um, looking at the we do programs. Um, we have kids, like I said, we have uh, over 126 kids participate this year um, in this club. Um, we, they were in partners and worked with our teams and actually did the coding and creating of these pieces and the kids. Um, I think the, the biggest piece as you talk to teachers is the teamwork between kids, the collaboration, and the continuing to try it over and over again, and know that when I make a mistake or it doesn't work the first time, that doesn't mean it's the end of the world, but I can go back and fix it and make a change, and it'll eventually work, or I'll have someone there to help me to figure out how to make it work. In the classroom, our engineering designs have taken, challenges have kind of taken a new life, um, in our school to really start connecting us to the real world. Not just here's what you do in school and here's what we learn about, but what does this look like in the real world? So one example is in fourth grade they have a water unit and their design was to create water filters. So on top of that our teachers uh, reached out to the community and found um, Joan, or Jan, I'm sorry, and she came in and did a presentation and talked about how she is using and creating water filters and supporting um, third world countries and getting clean water there. So the kids are really able to make that connection of why is this important and what are we doing, as well as go through the process of figuring it out um, and use the engineering design process. And of course the kindergartners are, it's amazing to see what they can do when the teacher steps back and lets them work together. So our kindergarten, this is the ramp project or the ramp challenge um, Greg was talking about, but they worked in teams. So, and we had this one the first trimester. So five-year-olds who've been in school in a month and a half in teams by themselves trying to figure this out. So we had a lot of parent support. We did it in small groups and they did it as a whole class and went over and over and really tried to figure out how to get that bus all the way to Safeco Field. So that's what they were trying to do. So they had a lot of different materials and constraints, and so they worked hard on that and um, were very um, engaged and excited about that work and really figuring it out um, and working together to do so. It helped a lot in their collaborating and their, and their thinking together. I'm going to turn it over to my lovely assistants here because they are going to tell you about what STEM has done for them this year in their robotics club as well as in the classroom. Uh, hi, my name is John, um, and so every week on Monday from 2.45 to 4.30, um, there are 30 kids from 4th uh, and 5th grade, and so we had one college student and two high school students, 
and two of our teachers, Ms. Johnson and Mr. Thiel, helped us out and we worked really, really hard to go to the FLL competition. And so the two parts of the competition are researching and programming. So when you research, you try to research about a natural disaster and for the programming, you try to program your robots to do nature's fury tasks. For the research part, we had to pick a natural disaster to research about. And we started with hurricanes, but decided that was too open of an idea. So we narrowed it down to storm surges. We had to um, research what kind of damage a storm surge caused, what was being done to fix the damage, and what was being done to prevent them from hitting cities. Then we had to come up with our own solution, and we had to search it up to make sure that no one else had already used it. Um, our solution. We also contacted some weather experts for help. In the competitions, we had to use our robots to perform tasks that we had selected on the mission maps, such as pushing an ambulance to a certain zone, knocking down towers, and raising houses. Everything was made out of Legos. To do this, our team had to use our club time to test and program our robots to do our chosen tasks. During breaks between competitions, we were able to add additions made out of Legos to our roads and improve our programming to better our performance in the next trial. While we were competing, we had three minutes to complete as many tasks as we could. Each time we completed a task, we got a certain number of points, depending on the difficulty. We had three trials to try and better our score. Um, so FF. FLL Robotics taught me, um, I learned how to program robots um, really quickly and efficiently so they were able to do um, complex tasks like what my friend Josephine said before. And so I was also able to read the visual code um, for the Mindstorms and over there they sort of have the kind of um, visual code that I'm talking about. Um, and so, yeah, so. We also learned how to be flexible and think outside of the box. As Katie said, we had to come up with a completely new, undiscovered solution to solve problems caused by natural disasters. However, we could incorporate other solutions into ours, but maybe tweak it and twist it a little bit. We also learned how to work as a team and cooperate. At the competition, we had to demonstrate the FLL core values. Here are some of them. Have fun, work as a team, we learn together, share discoveries with other groups. We were judged on how we could work together, how quickly we could work together, and how our cooperating skills work. So, during the competition, we had breaks in between, like Josephine said earlier, to better our score. We learned how to improvise as a whole team. During the robotics competition, we saw that other teams had modified robots unlike ours. So, during the 10 minute breaks in between our trials, we made our score better by modifying and programming our robots to do more tasks during the competition. The whole group worked together. So one of the things um, that they haven't taken any credit for is that at this competition they were primarily um, going against 7th and 8th graders who have done this and out of 50 they came out 30th out of 50.
So instead of having the teachers giving us directions and setting the perimeters, we as a group actually did that ourselves. And when things didn't work out, we kept trying, trying and over, over and over again. And this skill really helps us when we get up into the real world, like when we finally get a job. So <laughs> we're doing STEM, um, especially the science and math, I noticed a lot of difference that the kids did all the work. We're going to put it in the kids' hands and um, let them teach each other as well as how our teachers just guide them. So thank you guys again for having us come today. Um, I know that these work, you have questions later, would love to answer your questions. They could talk about this all day long. It excites them a lot. So I'll hand it back over to you guys. All right, so we've got quite a bit of time for questions. Feel free to raise your hand and you can ask questions of either one of them or the kids. Yeah. So, um, in terms of the selection of the three pilot schools, um, a number of components, including uh, the staff kind of readiness or willingness to get on board with the STEM initiative, um, the, the principal interest and leadership there, uh, but also we wanted to have a pretty diverse set of schools, both if you think about Newport Heights, Medina, and Ardmore spread out geographically and diverse in other ways too. So, the, the initial three. Um, to be truthful, we were really selected prior to my coming aboard with the STEM initiative, but that was my understanding for how they came about those three. And how will the next six schools for next year be um, So the, the next uh, six schools is a piece that we're working on. We don't have like a, a public list to share about what those next six schools are right now, but um, some of the same components looking at um, you know, the, the willingness and readiness of the staff to come on board. Ultimately, all the schools are coming on board. So whether it's next year or the following, we'll have all the, the Bellevue Elementary schools. So it, it really will be STEM for all schools and for all students. Mm -hmm. Yes? So you mentioned the, the WeDo and the FLL, mm -hmm. and kind of like their after-school activities. So who funds, who buys the kits that are expensive and the computers to run the robots and then pay the teachers? They're right. Thank you. Um, so just two, two uh, points I want to make. The first is that, I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question. The, the question was um, about the materials for the, the robotics, both the WeDo and the Mindstorms, and knowing that the materials aren't cheap and that the activity pay for the teachers who participate um, needs to be covered as well. So before I answer the question about the expense, I would say we are also looking at ways to work the robotics into the school day. So we've already had some experiences of bringing the robotics in and making connections. So you're right, while it does primarily live kind of in the after school um, and outside of the school day environment, some of that robotics work is, is working its way in. As for the expense, um, you know, Bellevue Schools Foundation has been a real critical piece of the, the work this year. Uh, and so we were able to use Bellevue Schools Foundation uh, funds for this grant to purchase materials. And so we're continuing to look at grants to support purchase of materials. But uh, Bellevue Schools Foundation has made that possible. Okay, so you're saying if your school doesn't offer the STEM program, how can you get into it? So, it will be all Bellevue schools, right? So, whether, I, I don't think it would make sense to really move a child from one to the other because it's, the impact is really going to be district-wide. Um, so, I, I wouldn't recommend a, a transfer to try to get on with the STEM school because they're, they're really all going that direction. It does take time, yeah, but I mean, we can't, so, we initially had five years and we've moved that up to three. So there's a good reason why it takes time that we have to, as we go, start in three so that we pilot and we have learning. It was important to start with three and not start with all the schools because we make adjustments as we go. So that when we really get to year three and we have all schools on board, we have a, a, you know, a product and a process that um, best supports students in STEM learning. So I, we, we will, um, I think the, the timeline for implementation is kind of important that it is and where it is, and if it, um, I think that's pretty much what I can say about that, you know. Yeah, there's another question here. Yep. Yeah. 
Could you give an example of how the math and science or STEM program is integrated with the English program currently established in the schools with your journeys? So I would say one of the ways that we're looking to strengthen that relationship is with the evidence-based reasoning piece. So when we have our STEM professional development, um, and this is something that Beth Hamilton alluded to earlier, um, we're looking to help with that critical development piece. And that, and that, critical, um, that critical thinking um, development is something that shouldn't be in a science silo, but really should be integrated into English language arts. So that comes back to what do common core state standards in English language arts look like? And those include you know, um, the evidence-based reasoning pieces. That's where our big overlap is right now. Another kind of example that I could give you is um, in an engineering design challenge at first grade, I was out at Newport Heights a couple weeks ago and I was co-teaching with a teacher over there. Uh, and one of the things they were the kids were doing was they were experimenting with different colors um, for a juice. And they were doing polling of classmates and, and, even, and even from other classes to get um, a sense for what's the most popular one, right? And what they did then, they were developing math skills in, in the sense that they were doing surveys and looking at bar graphs, these are first graders, right? And they were saying, oh, here's what kind of the data is telling us about our customers' interests. And then they write a letter to the president of the juice company to say, you know, and they're gonna use that same framework of claim, evidence reasoning, claim this, the best color for your juice is you know, XYZ evidence. We surveyed our, um, our class or this, this neighboring class and here are the numbers we got. Right? So those are the, the real tie-ins right there, is that we want the STEM experience to be integrated. Yeah. Right, so kids will not be tracked at middle school based on what elementary they're coming from. So regardless of what elementary they came in and came from or what um, experience they had at their elementary with STEM or, or not having STEM, um, they, that will not be a determinant in their, um, what classes they would take. It, it won't be a barrier for them. The teachers um, in our district, you know, differentiating instruction is really the core, you know, that's an important component of, of teaching. So they, they um, would have the ability to say, yeah, so, uh, so one student is coming with a little more familiarity, but we're not going to let that limit these other students. And we're going to make adjustments to our instruction to bring all the students to where they need to be. Yeah. Um, so I think um, after I've done FLL, um, I have liked STEM and I've understood it more, and I um, I think it makes more sense now to me. Um, and also, I think um, STEM is a good idea because then you can learn uh, <coughs> things that you might want to need for have for certain jobs, like. Um, Microsoft being a programmer there, um, and yeah. Well, I think maybe it helps us understand that school is not just like a torture. <laughs> not all of us want to sit there and just listen to the teacher talk on and on about multiplication when we're just bored out of our minds. Um, but STEM, I think we understand a little bit more. It's for our own good. <laughs> Thank you guys. Other questions? Yeah. My question is also for the students. Okay. So, I'm curious if how you guys would handle, sometimes when you get to 
together as a group of adults or as a group of students, that there's somebody that has a definite idea about food and just wants to take over the whole thing and has an exact way of doing things. How did you guys handle those kind of things? Or what did you learn? Well, when someone wants to take over the con con concert conversation, we um, kind of sometimes let them, but it's not always the right thing. So we, as the whole group, solve the problem by having um, someone um, um, like calm them down sometimes. Um, um, they can say yes to their idea, and everyone contributes, which is the, basically the goal for our conversation and how to solve our problems. So. Um, people usually say like yes and and share their own idea as well. So yeah. One of the things that we learned um, in teaching and giving kids more control is that kids need to learn how to interact with each other. And so we've done a lot in when we talk about English language arts, or we've done a lot in um, our work is that teaching kids how to actually collaborate and add on and giving them sentences stems or giving them pieces that they can help to do that. So I was in a classroom yesterday and they were um, arguing and talking about, it was a fifth grade classroom, they were talking about um, an excerpt from Thomas Paine's Common Sense for Social Studies. And they had questions, they were working together, they got into what we call a Socratic seminar and were working together to ask each other questions and they were using the language. My claim is Da, 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 da. my evidence for that, and then another child will go, well, what's your reasoning, or why do you think that, or how do, or I'd like to agree, I add on. So it's very, it's been a switch in the last year or two with critical thinking of just how you instruct kids and actually teach them how to disagree politely and um, also agree and actually listen carefully to each other. I thought it was interesting with these guys as they, you could tell they were listening to each other because as they talked, they said, and as my, as Josephine said, or as Katie said, um, and that's something we really have to teach kids, is not just talk and listen to ourselves talk, but to listen and add on to others. So it's been a definite teaching switch as well. Just to add on really quickly on that point. So when we do the professional development around the engineering design challenges, we intentionally connect it to the social emotional learning um, initiative that we have in the district, which is related to our positive and productive life initiative. Right? So we make connections there. For example, the, the charter, the elementary school classrooms have a charter for kind of how we students conduct themselves in the classroom. And that includes instances where they may need to have a back and forth about ideas. Because when we do these engineering design challenges, you know, there's an independent phase where students are imagining and coming up with their own designs and ideas. And then there's a planning phase where they have a discussion and um, come to an agreement on one that they would use. Right? It's teamwork and collaboration. So um, connecting that to the social and emotional learning piece in the charter is really important. And you heard Trevor use the yes and, right? That, that is one of the um, skills that, uh, language frames that they're provided with. There's a question here, yes. So at our school for the Lego We Do After School Club, um, we were able to have, um, we had 26 kids per trimester. Um, that, that's when we started. And so the first trimester we had 26 kids from kindergarten through third grade could sign up if they wanted to take part. It was free. And we had that goal. We got so many people that we had 120 some kids that wanted to do it. So what we did was we said, okay, and our teachers, and we looked, okay, we'll give 26 now, kind of lottery pick up, but we need to expand this for our second trimester and third trimester. So in winter and spring, we have two different classes going of 26 kids each, um, and two teachers for each. So we were able to accommodate every child who wanted to participate, um, to participate in the after school club. So all the families had an equal chance. Absolutely, yep, yep. And we did a lottery drawing. And for the FLL robotics, a little different. We had um, fourth and fifth grade, so I have about 100 and, I have 175, 180 fourth and fifth graders total. 
Um, we took everyone's, and there were some kids that did not get to participate because we had the lottery draw that only had 30 spots, and that was because we wanted to keep it small and test it out and try, like, what, what is this? And so, and how does this work in an elementary school? And so we're looking to next year to say, how could this expand or what could it look like so that more kids could participate? <laughs> Of, of moving kids up like you would at another grade level, but really just a component to the education that's added on, right? And a way to integrate what they're doing um, and make connections. And, and there are pieces that, we, that are new, that are added. So I think, you know, in accelerating this from five years and then bringing this down to a three year, we're really pushing that about as far as we can push it. it it's something that we looked closely at, and, and frankly, we faced the same question in bringing it to three and, and responded in doing that. I don't think that we can, um, you know, do more than that right now uh, and, and feel that we are, um, you know, do, going, getting the learning that we need through this process. Like this first year was a huge, there was a huge amount of learning. There were things that worked tremendously well that we know we want to um, increase and, and put more resources to and more training towards. But um, we need to go at a pace that makes sense for um, our teachers if we really want to have the impact on students that you're describing. And, and it's really important that we do that because if we just kind of push this out too quickly, um, it, it, you don't necessarily get the impact that you're seeking. We need to find a balance where, uh, believe me, our, our long-term interest fundamentally is for all students. And so we're pushing this as fast as we can to make sure that happens. Yeah. Uh, this was asked, but I didn't understand the answer. Were the programs full, of uh, the after-school programs full at Newport Heights and Ardmore? Yes, that was your question, right? Will there be, will there be wait, I have, there's part two, but will there be some analysis over the three years of how it works over, over the older kids, the older elementary, um, in sustaining interest and particularly in the girls and keeping their interest in the older elementary and through middle school yeah. um, in something like robotics. Sure. So, yeah, we did, um, we did have tremendous interest and uh, response to all the robotics programs in all three schools. 
And so we are continually looking at ways to, we, we are really filling the gap to add capacity to meet the needs of all students who have interest in doing that. And we do in, want, we are tracking um, who's participating right, in this and are we reaching all kids, uh, all kind of target groups, not just um, one demographic. Right? So yes, we are looking to measure those, those outcomes. And we've also tried to, uh, related to that, we've removed barriers, really. You know, but if you look at um, robotics programs, there, there can be you know, some gatekeeping. There can be um, even a, 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 an entrance fee to part a participation fee. So because of the grant, we're able to cover uh, that expense and make that free for students to opt in and participate. Other questions? Yeah, so, and, and I don't think we really wait till the end of K-5 to be thinking about 6-7. I mean, there's already great STEM work that's going on at 6-7, but it's true that we'll be taking what we learned about K-5 and thinking about what does this mean for middle school, and to the question about like, when kids get to middle school, um, who are, you know, have done the, the K-5 STEM, um, how, how do we really take the best advantage of the, the skills that they're coming in with then, right? And how do we continue to push for growth? So, um, yeah, we, we are thinking K-12, though right now my presentation focuses K-5, because when you're one of that pilot, we do have an, an eye on middle school and high school, and there is already good STEM work going on there. different or something that they need or the capacity at different levels. And so 
what can, as a PTA, do to support bringing some of these pieces in, whether it's before school, after school, or an assembly or a program, the pieces that they can fit in, and working um, with a partnership with the school to do those things. This is Julie, it's just let me know that we are out of time. And uh, I will remain here, and I'm happy to answer questions that you have. Uh, but I want to thank Bellevue Schools Foundation again for um, support of the work and thank all of you for coming out.